Today, as we reflect on our glorious Silver Jubilee years and move forward on our exciting journey in science, we are pleased and very honoured to have with us our Chief Guest, the Honourable Vice President of India, Sri Hamid Ansari. Thank you, sir, for gracing this occasion. On behalf of the JNCASR, I request you to kindly address the gathering. Honorable Governor of Karnataka, Shri Vaju Bhai Balaji, Honorable Chief Minister Siddharamaya Ji, Bharat Ratna Professor C.N.R. Rao, Professor P. Rama Rao, Professor K.S. Narayanan, Professor Vijay Raghavan, distinguished scientists, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I thank uh, Professor C.N.R. Rao for inviting me to this function today to mark the closing of the Silver Jubilee celebration of the Jawaharlal Nehru Center for Advanced Scientific Research, an institution of eminence dedicated to research and training in the frontiers of science and engineering. The Silver Jubilee coincides with the 125th birth anniversary of Jawaharlal Nehru, who is rightly called the architect of modern scientific and technological infrastructure in the country. He strove to promote scientific temper among citizens. He considered this to be the most important, potent instrument for combating the social and economic life ills of our society and for transforming the country into a modern, secular and progressive nation state. Nehru's vision for science and technology is best described in his oft-quoted statement of 1961, and I quote, It is science alone that can solve the problems of hunger and poverty, insanitation and illiteracy, of superstition and deadening custom and tradition, of vast resources running to waste, of a rich country inhabited by starving people who indeed could afford to ignore science today. At every turn we have to seek its aid. The future belongs to science and to those who make friends with science." End of quote. Based on this, our development plans have consistently emphasized the need for sustained investment in research and related activities leading to the creation of substantial capacity and capabilities in science and technology. The fruits of this effort are evident in our nuclear and space programs, information and communication technology services, automotive and pharmaceutical industries and other areas such as agriculture, healthcare, biotechnology, na nanotechnology, etc. Despite these achievements, it is widely felt that we have yet to realize our full potential in the field of scientific research and technological innovation. As the Indian economy continues on the path of rapid more inclusive and sustainable growth, it will be all the more necessary to ensure that our capabilities in science and technology grow in strength. Many positive steps have been taken by the government in recent years to give a boost to science and technology efforts. These are having a steady incremental effect. The overall outcome, however, is a mixed one. A paper titled The Research and Innovation Performance 
of the G20 published by Thomson Reuters in March 2014 gives some relevant data on the Indian science sector. One, it gained growth momentum in the last decade. India like China is rapidly enlarging its research presence globally. India's output of science papers expanded nearly three times the world average from 2003 to 2012. Due to this, India's share in world output increased from 2.5 to 3.6 percent. According to one estimate, we have moved from the 15th position in the year 2003 to the ninth position in 2010 in terms of scientific publications. Secondly, citation impact rose from about half to three quarter of the world average during the decade. While our contribution of highly cited papers as a percentage of the total output has improved, it has remained stubbornly low achieving by the year 2011 only about half of the 1% expected. Thirdly, in the 2005 to 2012 period, published patent applications originating from India have oscillated between 4,000 to 7,000 per annum, maintaining an average over the period of around 5,900 per annum which is around the same level as Australia and Great Britain. However, with a population of over 1.2 billion compared to 22 billion of Australia and 62 billion for Great Britain, this level can be considered particularly low. And fourthly, inventiveness in basic science as indicated by creation of intellectual property is low and India's innovation system ranking innovation system ranking varies between 50 and 60 amongst the nations of the world. Domestic innovation has remained stable from 1905 to 2002 I beg your pardon from 2005 to 2012 at around 29 percent. Nearly two-thirds of all patent applications in 2012 were from foreign concerns seeking protection for their innovation in the Indian market. In a report titled Science in India 2004-2013, Decade of Achievements and Rising Aspirations, prepared by the Science Advisory Council of the Prime Minister, some other challenges have been highlight, highlighted which need to be looked at carefully. Firstly, the percentage of our GDP spent on research and development has stagnated at around 1% for over two decades. Asian countries like China and South Korea have left us behind in R&D expenditure. Moreover, two-thirds of this expenditure comes from central government and only a quarter, I repeat, a quarter from industry. We need to increase the overall expenditure to at least 2% by the year 2017 as envisaged in the 12th five-year plan. More importantly, industry has to increase its contribution to R&D expenditure and bring it in line with the share contributed by industry in other comparable countries. Secondly, at the school le leaving level, there is great enthusiasm for science. However, as a career option for our students, science continues to rank below other streams mainly because it is seen as offering fewer opportunities. Consequently, there is a shortage 
of required human resources in higher education in science, including in advanced research. Thirdly, at the higher educational levels in the years 2005 and 6, India produced about 1,000 PhDs in engineering and technology, whereas the United States and China were already producing about eight times as many in 2005-06. In areas such as computer science, the situation is serious with only 25 or so PhDs being produced per year in India. And fourthly, during 2004 and 6, India produced one research scientist for every 7,100 people, while China did one in 1,080, Korea one in 2,040, and Sweden one in 163. It is thus clear that if our aspiration of becoming a leading global force in science is to be attained, a massive increase in science and technology education will be necessary both in quality and quantity. This would be essential in order to fulfill our domestic demand of science and technology human resources and to emerge as a quality supplier of scientific knowledge for the rest of the world. Our strengths in original research in basic science have been substantial, though science done in India has often led to striking new technologies being developed elsewhere in the world. It is believed that this is a consequence of the overall weakness of the innovation ecosystem in the country. We need to overcome it. To begin with, the widespread perception that basic science is not relevant for technology has to be dispelled. The Prime Minister's Scientific Advisory Council report, which I quoted earlier, rightly asserts that the results of basic research are a prerequisite for many future technological advances and societal benefits. Tomorrow's technology often depends on today's basic science. Innovative solutions will, therefore, have to be encouraged so that ideas which germinate in research centers reach the marketplace and go to benefit the society. The above facts and figures suggest that while there has been some progress, much more needs to be done if we are to be counted amongst the top-ranked countries in the world in scientific and technological research. In the years to come ahead, the government, private sector, industries, civil society, educational institutions, and all of us, we will have to work collectively to achieve six objectives. One, increase India's contribution to global scientific literature to the desired levels, including in high, highly cited papers. Two, increase our ownership of intellectual assets through higher levels of patenting. Three, making pursuit of scientific research an attractive career option for our youth and students. Four, imparting global quality scientific and engineering education to our students to create the required human resources for our own needs and for the rest of the world. Five, including in creating an environment which encourages free thinking, research and innovation in all spheres of science. And six, ensuring that some of our educational institutions, existing and new, should be ranked amongst the top 50 in the world. It is important, however, to keep in mind 
that mere increase in the number of PhDs or scientific institutions and publications or patents is not an end in itself. These are means to promote the well-being and progress of all sections of our society. The challenge before you, ladies and gentlemen, is to ensure that your work here in frontier areas of science and engineering through your seven units and outreach programs helps in identifying the causes behind our insufficient progress in some areas of agriculture in achieving energy independence and efficient water management in tackling, tackling climate changes and in providing universal health care and education and shelter to all. The modern state must of necessity be a welfare state and providing human security shall be its principal target. In this endeavor, the men and women of science have to be in the vanguard. It is here that the relevance of creating a scientific creating and sustaining a scientific temper assumes critical importance more so in an environment like ours where many people in our vast population tend to live simultaneously in different ages and oscillate between various shades of tradition, superstition and of modernity. This creates mental dilemmas as the poet John Milton put it. The mind is its own place and in itself can make a heaven of hell and a hell of heaven. Nehru probably had an inkling of the problem. In response to a question by Andre Barlow about the greatest challenge faced by him, he said and I quote, creating a just society by just means, perhaps too creating a secular state in a religious country." Unquote. The validity of this introspection lives with us to this day in the challenges that emerge to pluralism and secularism. Burton Russell who was a contemporary of Nehru, wrote in the year 1950 that mankind needs two kinds of things that are closely interwoven. I quote, organization, political organization for elimination of wars, economic organization to enable men to work productively, educational organization to generate a sane internationalism. On the other hand, it needs certain moral qualities. The qualities most needed are charity and tolerance, not some form of fanatical faith such as is offered by various rampant isms." End of quote. I venture to hope that given the exuberance of our young minds, some of whom are present in the audience today, we will continue on the right path and attain new heights in the field of research and innovation. Only that can make us a global knowledge powerhouse. I congratulate the center and its personnel on this landmark occasion and I wish you success in your future endeavors. Jai Hind! Thank you, Honorable Vice President, for your insightful remarks and for your words of encouragement.